I'm going to let them turn me down quite a bit. Okay, there we go. Good evening to all of you, and good evening to those who are worshiping with us online tonight. This is our last Wednesday before we get to Holy Week of our worship services on sermons preached by Jesus' enemies. And uh, our sermon preached tonight will be the witnesses, the false witnesses who said, we heard this Jesus say, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days as a testimony for why they should put Jesus to death. That'll be the sermon text of Jesus' enemies to look at tonight. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's begin by singing our first hymn, Sweet the Moments, Rich in Blessing. We now hear lesson five of the Passion account of our Savior. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who is misleading the people. Look, I have examined him in your presence. I have found in this man no basis for the charges you are bringing against him. Herod did not either, for he sent him back to us. See, he has done nothing worthy of death, so I will have him flogged and release him. At the time of the festival, the governor had a custom to release to the crowd any one prisoner they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner named Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a rebellion in the city for, and for murder. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So when they were assembled, Pilate said to them, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews to you? Which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called Christ? For Pilate, in fact, knew they had handed Jesus over to him because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, Pilate's wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that righteous man, she said, since I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas 
and to have Jesus put to death. The governor asked them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They all shouted together with one voice, Take him away! Release Barabbas to us! Pilate said to them, Then what do you want me to do with the man you call the King of the Jews? What should I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Crucify him! But the governor said, Why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting even louder, Crucify him! Pilate addressed them again, because he wanted to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! He said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no grounds for sentencing him to death, so I will whip him and release him. But they kept pressuring him with loud voices, demanding that he be crucified, and their voices were overwhelming. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him, and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit on him, took the staff, and hit him repeatedly on his head. They also kept hitting him in the face. Pilate went outside again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and guards saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told them, Take him yourselves and crucify him for I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He went back inside the palace again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate asked him, Are you not talking to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release Jesus. But the Jews shouted, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside. He sat down on the judge's seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, or Gabbatha in Aramaic. It was about the sixth hour on the preparation day for the Passover. Pilate said to the Jews, here is your king. They shouted, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, should I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, and then instead it was turning into a riot, he decided that what they demanded would be done. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this righteous man's blood. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Since he wanted to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. And so then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. After they had mocked him, the soldiers took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him away to crucify him. Jesus was carrying his own cross. As they were going out of the city, a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country. 
They placed the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd of people was following him, including women who were mourning and wailing for him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Be sure of this. The days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never gave birth, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things to the green wood, what will happen to the dry? Here ends our fifth reading. The last and final portion will be read on, during the Good Friday service next week. We continue with our next hymn, hymn number 121, Jesus Grant That Balm and Healy.
unto him who has loved us and has washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests unto him be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Words we want to take a look at tonight are from Matthew chapter 26, verses 59 to 61. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. This is God's word. Dear fellow believers, my mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. You maybe have heard somebody say that. Huh? Um, it reflects something that's called confirmation bias. When somebody has a certain point of view, it doesn't matter what information is given to them, what facts are shared with them, what the details are, their mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. And that's kind of what we see, I think, here in our text for tonight. We still see it still today in our world, don't we? All the time out there in politics, people have their own position they have, and their mind's made up. Don't confuse them with the facts that are out there. Uh, just recently down in Florida, the, the bill that the people who oppose it call it the don't say gay bill. And there's nothing in the whole bill that even uses the word gay. But because they want to put people against it, that's how they label it. Right? Their minds are made up. Don't confuse them uh, with the facts. I think we had a bit of that the last couple years with the pandemic, right? People's minds were made up, right? From the top on down. Don't follow the data. My mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. We're told here in our text that as they were putting Jesus on trial, they were looking for a way to put him to death. They didn't care what the facts were or what Jesus meant when he said what he said, they simply wanted to find a way to, to, uh, to, to execute him. Um, our theme for tonight is that, that uh, message that we have there from uh, verse uh, 60, 61, excuse me. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And that was reason enough for them to kill him in their mind. Now, let's get into it. Did Jesus say that? Yeah. Listen to John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus, um, let's begin with verse 18 there. The Jews demanded of Jesus, this is John 2, early in his ministry. Uh, the Jews demanded of Jesus, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? And this was right after he had cleansed the temple, the first part of his ministry there. And the leaders of the Jews got in his case and says, What miraculous sign can you show us, huh? That you have the authority to do what you just did here in cleaning out the temple of God of all those money changers and, and crooks. Some of them were there uh, who were operating their businesses in the temple courts. In verse 19, Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. He did say those words that they quoted in our sermon text, right? Destroy this temple, Jesus said, and I will raise it again in three days. The apostle John immediately clarifies what that meant. We read on, the Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, you know, Herod's temple that he had built, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. So Jesus did say that, right? Destroy this temple and I, and I will raise it again in three days. You know, we always have an obligation to take people's words at what they mean by those words, not to read our meaning 
into those words. That really applies with all the words of Scripture, doesn't it? Uh, we have no right to take people's words and make them say what we want them to say, as they were doing here in the testimony that those false witnesses gave on that uh, Monday, Thursday evening. Um, Jesus' own interpretation was referring to his body. Now the question, of course, for us tonight is, how so? How is the temple a picture, a type of Jesus' body? Well, think about it. Everything in that temple was a picture of what Messiah was going to do for his people. All those different regulations that God had given to his Old Testament people. First on the tabernacle and then later on the temple that Solomon built and then the temple that was rebuilt after its destruction by the Babylonians was meant to be picture language of Messiah, the savior of the Jews and of the whole human race. Examples outside of the main part of the temple was the big bronze laver, the, uh, the, the wash basin. Messiah was going to wash his people, baptize his people, right? Incorp make his people pure by his work for them. Or take another example, the showbread that was there inside the holy place. That bread was to be a picture of how Messiah would come and feed his people, that he would be the bread of life. We hear echoes of some of the words that Jesus said, right? I am the bread of life. And of course, the biggest way that that temple experience, you might say, was a type or a picture of Messiah were the sacrifices that took place there. And of the five different types of sacrifice, four were bloody ones, which in and of itself says a lot about Messiah. Or as the writer to the Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, right? And so that temple, the tabernacle before it, was truly a bloody place. Every morning, every evening, they opened the temple, they closed the temple with a blood sacrifice. Uh, blood sacrifices were done on behalf of the nation. Blood sacrifices were done on behalf of individuals. There really were four of those, like I said, four of those five types were bloody sacrifices. There was the sin offering and the trespass offering uh, and the peace offerings. Uh, and and the, also the whole burnt offering. And they all had different picture language for how Messiah would take away the guilt of the people. How he would reconcile people with God. The, uh, the guilt sacrifice especially emphasized how that would also reconcile you with one another. Um, the, the peace offering seems recognized that you were restored to the community. And that last offering, I preached on it uh, a couple months ago from Romans 12. Uh, the whole burnt offering where they threw the whole animal into the fire and the smoke went up to God. In Hebrew, it was called the Olah, because in Hebrew, Olah means to go up. And God, figuratively speaking, smelled it and said, Ah, this pleases me. This is what was done in the temple again and again and again. Everything there pointed to Jesus, to his body, right? To his wonderful sacrifice that now we in hindsight look back and see that he offered for us. You want a commentary on how all that Old Testament stuff, you know, pointed to Messiah? Read the book of Hebrews. Study the book of Hebrews. Read it again and again because it's deep stuff, but it's good stuff, huh? That shows that, that Christ is better. It's the big word that runs throughout the whole book of Hebrews. He's better than all that Old Testament stuff because the Christians, the believers at the time of the book of Hebrews were being tempted to go back to being Jews again instead of keeping their trust in Jesus as their Messiah, because persecution was there and was on the horizon. Huh? Um, and the one big point that Hebrews makes not only better, it's better and therefore it's done. It's finished. Huh? It's kind of a commentary on Jesus' words from the cross. It is finished, paid for in full. Destroy this temple. Those false witnesses said, that's what he said? In three days I'll raise it again. Of course, they thought he was talking about the physical temple. But he was talking about the temple of his body. The ironic thing about that is the temple was destroyed. Forty years later, when Titus, the Roman emperor, came in with his armies, they wiped out the city of Jerusalem. They wiped out the temple. Never to be truly rebuilt again. God's temple was destroyed. But Jesus has restored it, right? In a spiritual way. 
Huh? Uh, who's God's temple now? That beautiful hymn we have in our hymnal. We are God's house of living stones, builded for his habitation. He through baptismal grace us owns, heirs of his wondrous salvation. Were we but to his name to tell, yet he would deign with us to dwell with all his grace and his favor. Uh, Peter speaks about we being a spiritual house built unto God. Uh, we are God's temple. We are God's house. Because the gospel rules in our hearts. And Jesus is there in our hearts. Yes, the physical temple is gone. If any of you ever get to Jerusalem or have been there, you know, all they got left is the wall where they stand and put their little prayer nuggets in there. That's all that's left of the temple. But the real temple is us, the Christian church. And we know the future of that church. Jesus himself told it to Peter when Peter made that beautiful confession. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, yeah, you're rightly named Peter. Rocky, rock man. And on this rock, different Greek word, this confession you've just made that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's us as we face our, our wild world, our culture, and the attacks on our faith, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. God's church will persevere. God's temple will continue. Because until the end of time, God will see to it that every single one of his elect is incorporated into that, that temple of his. Jesus does restore it in us. May God comfort you with that for his sake. Amen. The peace of God, which is beyond our human understanding, will keep our hearts and our minds centered in Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. We now gather our offerings. Let's stand up and pray. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds, but because of your amazing love for us, we know that you do not punish us for our sins anymore, but because you punished your son Jesus in our place. Comfort us with the message of that salvation. Help us always to remember our Jesus who obeyed your will perfectly and who gave his body into suffering and death, poured out his body as a sin offering for us, so that we might receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life in his name. Uh, we ask you to look with favor upon your servants here at Shepherd of the Plains. Uh, we have need for a full-time pastor, and we, a, we ask you to lead our congregation and our church body uh, to provide that shepherd for us in the weeks and months ahead so that we can spread this good news of what the Lenten season is all about uh, to our community and to our families and to one another. Uh, we ask all of this in the name of your son Jesus who also taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated and join me in our closing
Well, good to see all of you here tonight. Good to have you online, those who are uh, worshiping with us uh, on the internet. Uh, you have some announcements, as you can see. Uh, we're going to clean up the grounds and turn our bushes and tidy up the prayer garden, garden this Saturday. Get ready for Holy Week, which is clearly the high point of our, our Christian faith, isn't it? Um, sort of like a roller coaster ride. You start at the top with Palm Sunday in a way, right? Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And then, ooh, you go down, right? You got Maundy Thursday, but then you really go down Good Friday. And then, of course, you really go to the top on Easter Sunday. You see the different times that are listed there. One addition, too, because we just made the decision to do it about uh, 40 minutes ago. Uh, but we are, <laughs> we are going to do something at 8 o'clock on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, I'm going to put together some upbeat Christian uh, Easter music have kind of a devotional service. Uh, I got some Christian uh, Easter music that I think you'll enjoy and intersperse it maybe with a few devotional thoughts. Those of you online, uh, if you're going to be watching online, join us at 8 or anytime thereafter. Uh, I think you'll enjoy the music and the devotions that are there. Then the breakfast is at 9 and the uh, celebration worship service will be at 10.30. So that's what I have for you tonight. Anything else that we need to announce to each other or to our viewers?